Hi everybody, Fide Master Dennis Monacrucis here, and today we're going to continue our series on the super fast night dwarf, which um, of course is long since, uh, well, it's been ironic for quite some time now. At any rate, this is part four, just on the night dwarf, and um, we're covering the poison pond. So last time, the poison pond, for those of you who are brand new to all of this, arises in the Sicilian, so that's the Sicilian. And this is the Night Orf. And Queen of B6 constitutes the Poison Pawn variation, or at least the introduction to it. Um, there are three other moves that we're, we have yet to discuss. Queen C7, Knight B to D7, and Bishop to E7. And we may get to the first two of those by the end of this um, presentation. I don't, I wouldn't count on it, but it's possible. All right, so queen b6, and we looked at various side lines in this last time, as well as one of the main lines. So queen d2, queen takes b2, rook b1, queen a3. And here, there are two main lines. There's e5 and there's f5. f5 we discussed last time, so this time it's on to e5. Okay, so white is trying to blast open lines here as quickly as possible to displace this knight. It opens the d file, it opens the f file. And since white has a pretty big lead in development, this is naturally, um, all things being equal, to his advantage. The question is whether uh, black has the defensive resources to, to hold on. And over the years, it appears that, that he certainly does, although it's very dangerous, and there have been numerous games where black has lost quickly and painfully. And we'll see a little bit of that today. All right, so there are two main moves here. There's D takes E5, and there's H6. We'll have a look at both. Okay, so D takes E5. This is not as common nowadays. F takes E5, Knight F to D7, and then here we have um, various moves that are possible too. So um, one move that's old but also had a recent outing that went pretty well is Knight to E4. Okay, and this looks... Pretty, pretty natural. So uh, this does a few things. So this knight is taking aim at squares like d6. Also it clears uh, the third rank, so this rook might come over someplace. Uh, not necessarily f3, but just that it comes up to b3 and can come over somewhere, depending on what black does. And all right, certainly black is okay here, but um, we'll, we'll look at a couple of disasters that have befallen, uh, befallen them nevertheless. All right, so one great old game in this variation saw queen takes a2, and this is just a fantastic game. This this occurred in the game Tall against Tolish from the uh, Soviet Championship in 1956. Typical of the young Tall, I mean, just one of the most complicated games you can imagine. And there are various mistakes, but I, I just want to quickly show you the moves of the game, and uh, you can see just how unbelievably complicated it was. All right, so rook to b3, as mentioned. Uh, this does a few things, so it prepares the rook for battle, but it also cuts the, the queen off, and so in some cases there may be some mayhem on e6. All right, queen a1 check, queen a4, so the queen's now better posted. Tall plays bishop to b5. Again, very typical of Tall. <clears throat> like old-style Morphy, he wants to get his pieces into play as quickly as possible, and almost at whatever cost. So a, b, knight, b5, threatening knight to c7 mate f6, e takes f6, g takes f6, and so here Tall's down a piece, and two of his pieces are in pre, the knight on e4, and the bishop on g5, so Tall plays the brilliant rook to e1, so just, you know, spare parts, who cares? <coughs> Tolish plays rook to a6, um, protecting the e6 pawn in advance, bishop f6, knight f6, knight f6, rook f3, And the attack just continues, and Tall finds new ways of bringing pieces into, into play. You can see, I mean, every one of his guys is, is contributing to the attack in some way or other. And so Tall wins the queen. Black's king is still in trouble. White's ar or Black's army is strewn about and uncoordinated and, and rather loose. And the game ends fairly quickly. So this is not mate, rook e2, and everything's covered. The knight on d7 is hitting all kinds of things. So um, black is just lost here and resigned. 
All right, it's a great game. Obviously, I wasn't really trying to present it. I, I did present it once upon a time, I think, in an old chess-based show. Maybe. Um, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll present it at some point. At any, at any rate, uh, fantastic game, well worth spending some time on. Kasparov, I think, analyzes this and my great predecessors. But um, can't be sure. I'm not sure about that offhand, but I, I think he does. Okay, so another game with 94, much more recent game which shows just how possible it is to, to go awry in this, was Rajabov against Anand. So Rajabov, as I mentioned last time, is the guy who really brought this E5 variation back into the forefront just a few years ago. And here's a nightmare suffered by the world champion. So knight E4, instead of um, queen takes A2, Anand played H6, bishop H4, and now he should play queen takes A2. So instead he played queen to a4 and just fell apart quickly. So bishop to e2, knight c6, so everything looks kind of normal. Black is catching up in development, he still has pawn up, his queen looks really well posted on a4, but it actually was better placed on a2 for the specific reason that it covered the e6 square. So knight takes e6, and Anand is just lost, because if f takes e6, bishop h5, and bishop takes g6 as checkmate. So Anand played g5 and lasted all of one more move. So see if you can figure out how Rajabov ended the game basically on the spot. Played one more move and Anand resigned. Well, the answer is this. Knight f6 check. Um, if king to e7, queen to d6 is mate. And if knight takes f6, knight c7 check. King e7, queen d6, again as mate. So Anand resigned here after just 16 moves. Now, it's only a blitz game, but still, to beat Anand in 16 moves, whatever kind of game, is um, pretty impressive, and it shows the, the danger that's that's there. Now, objectively, black is okay in this variation, but uh, certainly it's quite easy to go, to go off the rails. All right, instead of knight to e4, though, bishop to c4 is another important move. And... Um, this has been played lots and lots of times. It was a very big line in the 60s and 70s, and uh, but it got worked out eventually. Okay, so a bad move here seems to be bishop to e7 because of bishop takes e6. And um, now there's been lots of analysis here, but um, okay, we'll, we'll see some of it. So best is to castle, castles. And now, all right, if f takes e5, f takes e6, excuse me, this happened actually in a 1958 game between Duke Steen and Irva, the former world champion, and uh, Irva lost. So it went like this, knight e6, knight e5, and already here he's, he's losing. So white's attack is too strong, and actually he's just going to be um, up material here. So takes, knight c7, queen d5, knight e6. And he just has too many things that he can attack. So actually, black is doing okay on material. He's got two pieces for a rook. But white's pieces are so active, blacks are so vulnerable, and his king's not very good either. So uh, Duke Steen went on to beat his great opponent. Okay, threatening rook takes f8 check, and queen takes g7 mate. You can see, all of white's pieces are in play, and here black couldn't recapture because uh, rook takes uh, f6 is just too strong. Also, just queen takes d7, so it doesn't even matter. So, anyway, the game continues from here, but white's dead one. Up the exchange and a pawn for basically no compensation. Okay, so that was f takes e6. So, a later improvement was bishop takes g5, and after queen takes g5, h6. Now, there's a Fisher game, at least one. Let me see what I got here. Yeah, so uh, the game b like against Fisher continued with queen to h4. And this had been analyzed um, as well. So various moves were analyzed by Irva. He thought they also lost, so he thought knight takes e5 also loses, and f takes e6 also loses. But Fisher improved with queen takes c3. And now, okay, rook takes f7, rook f7, queen d8, knight f8, takes, takes, Rook f1. And this looks really scary, but Fisher had analyzed all of this at home, 
played bishop to d7 now. And, you know, white's position looks really good, but he's down a piece for a pawn. And if there's no concrete way for him to either give mate or win the material back, he's just going to be lost. So knight f3, queen e3, king h1, queen c1, queen takes c2. So it just grabs the pawn, drives the knight back, and puts the burden back on white to show something. Now, it looks as if white could put up good resistance with h4. Uh, one idea, that this is given by Soltis in his book on Fisher, goes like this. So bishop c6, knight f3, knight to d7. Now h5 check. And then here white is mate in two. So you get three seconds to solve it. Knight g5. Um, actually, that's not mate in two because the, the king can go to e6, then knight e6 check, and then queen takes g7. So it'd be mate in three in that variation. So takes, and then here is mate. However, after h4, instead of bishop to c6, black should give up the uh, the exchange here, or give up the rook and go the exchange down. But after knight takes e5, uh, black has a lot of threats. So bishop to c6 is a threat. The idea of mating on g2. Knight to g4 is a bit of a threat, uh, with the idea of knight to f2, and if king h2, then maybe queen c7. And uh, threat number three, perhaps queen to e4, aiming at h4. And it looks as if black has better chances here. So Soltis analyzes, for example, knight f3, check, check again. Just queen takes a2, queen a3, hitting the rook and threatening queen to d6, check. And OK, so here the, uh, the smoke kind of clears a little bit. Black has two pawns for the exchange. White's king is somewhat vulnerable, so black is, is better here, but not winning. All right, so that was, from here, what would happen on h4. Uh, instead, Bielek played rook to g8, and Fischer finished quickly. So queen f2, keeping white's queen off of f6. That was the threat, queen f6 check. And after rook f8, it just grabs, no problem. Rook f3, king h7, and here Bielek realized that he just doesn't have any attack in the position, and gave up. So this was a uh, typical Fisher's chess, tremendous um, preparation, especially for the pre-computer era, and uh, you know, was just a devoted follower of this of this opening, and managed to achieve great things in it. However, after h6, instead of queen to um, sorry, instead of queen to h4, the best move is queen to h5. And after queen h5, black is in some trouble. So here, if f takes e6, knight e6, takes, takes, threatening queen to e8, and then, um, well, OK, at least, let me see. Well, queen e8, queen f7, general, yeah, well, so of course, queen f7, and queen g7, mate. So queen to e7, and now queen to f5 seems to be winning the ideas to play um, knight to d5, if nothing else. And black seems to be lost here. And if queen takes c3, which is what Fisher played against queen h4 instead of queen h5, well, now it's different. Rook f7. And the nice point is that white doesn't have to, have to bother defending this knight. So queen takes d4. See, the, the plus of this, rook f7, with queen on h5, is that rook takes f7 is no good for black anymore. So queen takes d4, king h1, king h8, rook b to f1. And white doesn't need this, this knight on d4. He's just um, just winning here. So that's the end of 12 bishop to e7, I believe, or at least uh, an indication of why it's over. Now, queen a5 is playable, but I'm not going to say anything about that, because bishop to b4 is the main line, and it seems to be good. OK, so here rook to b3, queen a5, castles, castles. And now here we have further theoretical adventures. OK, so again, I'll present a quick Fisher game. And this is against Tringov from Havana in 1965. Uh, the Bielek game was from the Inner Zola in Stockholm in 62, by the way. All right, so here Tringov played knight takes e6, which is, again, natural, blasting open lines, but just doesn't work out, as we'll see thanks to Fisher's very accurate play. So takes, takes, king over, rook takes. Now, now not knight takes because bishop takes c8, so bishop takes f8. Black's up a piece for a pawn, queen f4, and the threat is to play queen f7 and queen to g8 mate. 
And so here, let me recommend that you figure out for yourself what Black should do. Because I, I think this was perhaps known at the time, and it was, again, Fisher who um, proved that previous analysis of previous games on the subject were, um, were inadequate, that Black is, in fact, just fine here if he plays correctly. So this is a, a big tactical test for you here. See if you can figure out what Fisher worked out at home. Okay, well, what do we do about this threat? Well, Fisher just seems to ignore it. He plays knight to c6, which is very good. Okay, white plays queen f7. And now here, knight to e7 is no good because just bishop takes e7. But he plays queen to c5 check, protecting his bishop on f8. That's the point. King h1. And now, knight f6. So this stops the mate. Of course, it returns the piece, but uh, only for an instant. Because if e takes f6, then bishop takes e6. Okay, black can, or white can throw in f takes g7. It doesn't matter. Queen takes, queen takes g5, and black is still up a piece. And notice that white can't play rook takes b7 because queen to c1 followed by, by mate. So after knight f6, Tringoff played bishop takes c8, and now knight takes e5. So another Zwish and Zug here. And after queen to e6, a third Zwish and Zug, knight e to g4. And now the knight on f6 is adequately guarded, and of course white can't preserve his, rook, his uh, bishop on c8 because of the threatened smothered mate. Uh, well, actually it won't even be a smothered mate because there's no queen sack, so it'll be mate on f2 or g1. Um, and of course white can stop it, but... Um, then he's going to lose the, the, rook, the bishop on c8. His attack is over. His king is vulnerable. So Tringov resigned here. 22 move loss. All right. So that meant that knight takes e6 was no good. So people moved on and found bishop to f6. Very dangerous move. All right. So for instance here, there's a game between Robert Byrne and Larry Evans from the, uh, I think, the U.S. Championship in 1965, or at least some New York event in 65. And Evans took, and he got killed in beautiful fashion by Byrne. So queen of h6. Okay, so now, of course, there are all kinds of obvious ideas, like moving the knight on c3, or playing rook f3, and then bringing a rook to g3, followed by queen of g7 mate. Okay, so queen takes e5. Seems to bring the queen back into the danger zone here, and also threatens queen takes d4. But it's not so simple, and Byrne played a spectacular move. Knight f5, cutting the queen off um, and, and really creating this barrier on the f-file that prevents black's pieces from coming over to help defend. All right, e takes f5, and now knight e4. So it looks like giveaway chess, but the idea is rook h3 and queen takes h7 mate. And also notice, okay, that... Once black plays e takes f5, the bishop takes aim at f7. So after e f5, knight e4, if, for example, f takes e4, let's say rook to h3, rook to d8, we'll see that there's mate in two, like this. So very attractive combination here by, by Robert Byrne, who's once a candidate, a uh, second time almost a candidate, so very, very uh, outstanding player in American chess history. Okay, so Evans tried bishop to d2, little deflection here. Knight takes d2, queen d4 check, and now knight to e5. So very clever. He's managed to uh, give himself the option of playing knight to g6. And considering that he's still up a piece in two pawns, this looks at first like pretty good news. All right, but it's not quite as good as he hoped. So rook to g3 check. Now, if uh, knight to g6, rook to h3 is decisive for the familiar reason of queen takes h7, followed by queen takes f7 mate, if necessary. So knight to g4, h3. And uh, remarkably, all of white's pieces are just protecting each other. So it's not by much, but they're holding on. Okay, so queen to e5, threatening to take the rook. So burn plays very calmly, rook to f4. Queen e1 check. Again, attacking a couple of pieces, but knight f1. So it's very, very elegant the way the pieces just keep protecting each other. So black never quite gets out of this this mess. So queen takes g3. And now um, 
again, it looks like black is in good shape. Knight takes g3, knight takes h6. But rook takes g4 check, queen g4, hg4. Now, black has two rooks and two pawns for the queen. So in that respect, he's doing all right. But white still has threats here. So the threat is to play knight g3, knight h5, and then either queen g7 or knight takes f6, depending on circumstances. So black plays knight to d7, which at least covers um, f6, knight g3, king h8. So on knight h5, he's going to play rook to g8. So he's putting up good resistance. I mean, he's making burn have to earn it, and he does. So he plays bishop to d3. Now if the knight moves from d7 to protect, so that way the bishop on c8 protects f5, that allows queen takes f8 mate. So can't do that. Rook g8, bishop f5. And now rook to g7 is no good because knight to h5, and the rook can't be protected. It's going to have to move, but then it's, you know, it's lost. It's going to have to go to g6. So might as well go to g6 first. Takes, takes. Now knight e4, threatening. Um, oh, no, it's not threatening. Knight takes f6, excuse me. But uh, certainly well posted. And uh, maybe g5 is now the threat. In fact, that's what happens. So b5, g5. And if f5, then knight f6 is fatal. So bishop to b7, knight takes f6, threatening queen h7 mate, so knight f8, queen h2. The queen's going to go to e5 with all kinds of nasty threats. Bishop c8, queen e5, knight e6. So everything's protecting um, each other, but only for a moment. Knight to d7 check, and black resigned because after king to g8, knight to b6, and black is losing at least a piece there, maybe two. Okay, so a beautiful game by Robert Byrne, and it sure looked for the moment like bishop to f6 was some kind of uh, killer. But black, of course, found improvements, and knight takes f6 was the improvement that saved the day here. So he does take this bishop before white can play queen g5, g6, queen h6, and then mate on g7. But he does it in a way that doesn't destroy his pawn cover just yet. So anyway, e takes f6, and now queen and g5 is no threat because the queen's covering it. Well, black does, or white does have a threat, though. Rook takes b4, and then queen g5, queen h6, etc. So here, black played rook to d8, and the point of this is that now on rook takes b4, queen b4, queen g5, g6, if queen to h6, it's no big deal, he can just play queen to f8. So meanwhile, white's down the exchange, and practically all of his pieces are hanging here, or all of his minor pieces are hanging. So the bishop, the knight, and the other knight. So white's got to find something really good really fast. So he played rook to f4. The idea is a typical one. Um, he wants to play rook h4 and then queen h6. So rook takes d4, queen h6, queen f8, takes, takes, rook takes d4, and after all of this, black is simply up a pawn in the endgame and went on a win. So this was played between Robert Byrne and Bernard Zuckerman, who was a, not a player of Byrne's caliber by any means, but, but a good player. I mean, he's a, a good, strong I am, but a, a great um, a player who was really excellent in preparation and also a friend of Fisher's. So it's, it's at least possible that um, this might have been some analysis by Fisher, though uh, I don't say that's at any rate. Zuckerman, I'm sure you know he could have, uh, might have been able to find this himself. But they were they were friends, and um, it, it's at least possible that he got this from Fisher. Okay, at any rate, that was um, a pretty convincing way to meet this bishop f6 line, and I think it's still well. I'm not sure if it's out of business, but I, I think it's not really the uh, the happening thing anymore. Anyway, going back here. Generally, d takes e5 isn't played, and h6 is, I think, considered the more accurate approach. Okay, so bishop to h4, d, e, f, e, knight f to d7, knight e4, queen a2, rook d1. All right, so this has become the big trendy variation nowadays. And black plays queen to d4 here, recentralizing the queen, hitting the knight on e4, hitting the pawn on e5, and it looks pretty good. Okay, so white plays queen to e3 clearing the uh, the d-file, or he's clearing the uh, the rook on the d-file to uh, do various mischievous things against black's queen, while also protecting the knight. Now here, black has tried at least a couple of moves. Queen takes e5 is definitely the main move, 
But let's briefly discuss bishop to c5. All right, well, here, what do you think white should do? So this looks pretty good at first sight. Of course, white could play knight takes c5, but that knight's a very dangerous piece with the, the possibility of hopping into squares like d6 and f6. So if it's not necessary to get rid of it, white would prefer not to. And in fact, the move that he chooses here is knight takes e6. Okay, so now if queen takes e6, well, then knight takes is okay. Maybe, yeah, yeah. maybe he could, even, he could even consider rook takes d7. Nah, knight takes d7. All right, so queen e6, knight c5 is fine. Uh, black plays bishop to b4 check. Uh, of course, if bishop takes e3, then um, I think just knight to c7 check. I'm trying to see if there's something more. Like if you can play two moves in a row, rook takes d5 and knight, e, knight to d6 is mate, but... You don't get to play two moves in a row. So um, I think just knight c7, d5 is uh, indicated. And it looks good for white. Okay, so bishop to b4 check, c3, queen e6, c takes b4, castles, and now rook to d6 is very nice. So it, it looks a little strange. We force black to take this this e pawn, which would seem to be to, uh, to his advantage, but in fact it's not. And also white gets some nice pressure against um, f7. So bishop to c4. Okay, now here both knight to c6 and queen to h5 have lost. Um, Palliser, I think, in um, chess pub on chesspublishing.com suggests maybe knight to b6 can hold. And so he gives the following variation, which probably requires a closer look. But goes rook takes b6, bishop f5. So this is the point. Black can pile up on the knight on e4 and regain the piece. So knight f6 check, gf6, queen takes, pawn takes, castles here. And although white's got a better structure, a better minor piece, and obviously a much better rook, he is down a pawn, and, and maybe black can survive with a5. So he'll get rid of uh, the queenside pawns, and if he can do that successfully, then he's all right. But, you know, white can't really play b5 because a4 is at least dangerous. So b5, a4, bishop b1, a3, bishop c3, a2, bishop a1. You know, white's not giving himself much of a margin for error there. So it's uh, this might give black just enough to hold. That said, after queen e3, the overwhelmingly most common choice for black is queen takes e5. Okay, now bishop to e2, now bishop to c5. Bishop to g3, and then here a uh, couple of moves. So again, a, a Palliser suggestion is queen to d5. Looks a little bit precarious. Bishop to f3, and the threat's knight to f6, check winning the queen. But Palliser's neat idea is that black says, yeah, so what, and just allows it. So castles, knight f6, knight takes, bishop takes, uh, bishop to b4, check. So that way on c3, knight takes d5, and that pawn will also fall. So king f1, and now e takes d5. So that's the point behind waiting and throwing this bishop to b4 check first. So uh, white's, white's got the queen, yes, but black has two minor pieces and three pawns, and white's king is a little bit awkward. The e file is going to be very nice. Black's knight's going to go to e4. The bishop goes to g4. So um, it's, it's a pretty unclear position. I, I think... At least at a glance, I would probably rather have black here than white, certainly in a, in a fast game. Um, I'm not sure. In a tournament game, I mean, you work things out, and uh, what looks attractive may may not prove to be so. But at least at a glance, uh, black's position looks more fun. It looks a lot easier to find good moves for black than for white. So that's probably worth considering, too. The main move is bishop takes d4. And after rook takes d4, queen a5 check. Rook d2, castles, bishop d6, and this is the main line position here. And I think currently theory says that black should play knight c6, give up the exchange, and then white castles. And, okay, black has three pawns for the exchange, but white, of course, has a lead in development. Um, his pieces are pretty aggressively posted. The f-file is nice. You can see lines where knight f6 check happens. So... You know, this is this is where where the fun starts in contemporary poison pawn theory, or at least one of the main places where where it begins. 
So I wish you the best with this variation. Um, I leave it to you to do your own analysis from this point. Okay, now from here, we're actually going to get to the other moves. Okay, so the other three moves are all quite closely interrelated. So there's queen to c7, knight b to d7, and bishop to e7. And often black ends up playing all three moves in a row, and it's just a question of which, which uh, order they occur in. Now, queen c7, I don't want to say too much about, because, again, it's generally of transpositional value. Let's say queen f3, and then black either play bishop to e7, which will transpose into the bishop to e7 line, or can play knight b to d7, which transposes into the knight b to d7 line, and after castles, can either play b5, which sticks to knight b to d7, or play bishop to e7, when, hey, we're in the bishop to e7 main line. What fun. Okay, the distinctive with queen of c7 is that white will sometimes play bishop takes f6, g takes f6, and then, okay, queen of d2, and it becomes kind of like a, a Richter rouser in the classical Sicilian. So this is where this thing goes. Uh, knight to c6 is the main move here. White castles. Um, bishop to d7 is the main move. Let's say king to b1. Castles queen side, and so on. All right, bishop to e2, the idea of bishop to h5. Again, a very typical idea in the, uh, in the Rouser Sicilian, putting pressure on this pawn on f7. So black standard response is to play h5. White plays rook h to f1, preparing f5. And again, this is all just very typical uh, Richter Rouser stuff. Um, the point of the f5 threat is that either we take and we weaken e6 and open the f-file, or black plays e5, and then there's this nice juicy hole on d5. And so black has to figure out what to do about this threat. All right, well, I leave that to you, and we'll, we'll leave queen to c7 behind um, from here. Okay, so the next move is knight b to d7. And I should mention that I just did a show on this uh, for chess base yesterday, and... Um, so the game that I covered there was Nakamura against Gelfand. And Gelfand is the specialist on the knight b to d7 line, where uh, it, it doesn't transpose into, into other lines. So with this, I mean, there's just tons and tons of theory, and, and I really recommend that you, you watch that. So I, I intended that, that show to be a supplement to what we're doing here. Um, and I, we went in, in painful detail into the theory of, of that variation. So let me just very quickly get my notes from that and, and give you some highlights. All right. So uh, from this point, white has quite a number of moves. But, okay, we'll, we'll get to the, uh, the main line. So queen f3, queen c7, castles long. Again, bishop to e7 transposes into the bishop to e7 variation. But b5 is the distinctive line. Okay, and now here white has all kinds of possibilities. So there's e5, and this usually is, is played as a uh, quick perpetual check draw variation. So it goes like this, bishop to b7, queen h3, d takes e5, knight takes e6, takes, takes, bishop to e7, um, bishop takes b5, a takes b5, um, knight takes b5 here, queen to c6, Knight to d6 check, king to d8, f takes e5, king c7, queen takes e7, rook a2, e takes f6. I mean, this looks thrilling. The only problem is that this has been played many, many times. I mean, it's just a, a line that people play when they don't want to have a real game. And, um, okay, the game Ivanchuk against Gelfand in Sochi. Sochi in 2006 was dr agreed drawn here, but... Uh, it's been agreed to many, many times. So I, I can see just at a glance in, in, my, uh, in the PowerBook database, at least 16 times this position has occurred. And it probably doesn't count the ones that have already been drawn a move or two before uh, or in this position. So, and, and there are going to be more games besides the ones mentioned in PowerBook. So again, it's a, kind of a, a cop-out, take-a-day-off variation. All right, so that's E5. Uh, another line of interest is a3, but this is kind of wimpy. Um, usually it's not such a great thing for white to take a, a timeout to play that move. 
So nothing special. G4, black is uh, bishop to b7, g4, bishop b7. Black is fine. And this is really like um, the bishop to e7 variation now, but with white having played the not really ideal a3 later on. So this is nothing special. Uh, a much more interesting line is bishop takes b5. Okay, so here we have some fun. A takes b5, knight d takes b5, queen to b8, e5, and here probably the best move, um, well, rook to a5 is a move, and it's an important move, but I think bishop to b7, at least judging by Gelfin's praxis, is currently viewed as the, uh, the best choice. So queen e2, pawn takes, queen to c4, bishop e7, knight c7, king f8, takes, takes, Rook d1, and okay, this is all one complicated mess. And at the end of the day, after a whole lot of capturing, the position seems to be about equal. So this was a game between Nidich and Gelfin from Dortmund in 2006. Black is all right here. Okay, so that is bishop takes b5. But wait, there's more. So Carlson, Magnus Carlson, played bishop takes f6 against Gelfand and Beal in 2005. And this is kind of like the 10 e5 variation. In other words, e5 instead of bishop takes f6, but with a twist. So here, after queen h3, d takes e5. Now white doesn't take on e6, but plays knight c takes b5. And this too leads in, in some sharp directions. And uh, that game was agreed drawn. I'll just give a couple moves here. Knight e4. White played bishop to c4. And I'll let you look up the rest of this, but it was um, ended up as a perpetual check about 10, 11 moves later. Again, insane complications. All right. Well, all of this is fun, and yet none of these are the main move. The main move on move 10 nowadays is bishop to d3. Or at least I think it's the main move. Um, okay, now bishop to b7, rook h to e1, queen to b6, and um, okay, castles has been played before too, but queen to b6 is the move nowadays. Okay, and now white can play things like knight to b3, but that's a little bit um, a little bit wimpy, although Elvis did beat Gelfand in an old game, 1991, with that variation. Um, queen to e3 was played by Ivanchuk in Beersheba in 2005. That was a, a draw. But the main move, and the move that really makes this variation a lot of fun, is knight to d5. Okay. Now, the first thing that was played against this was e takes d5. But this isn't very good. And see if you can figure out why. So I would definitely re recommend, if you want to try this seriously, you probably will want to stop the recording for quite some time. Okay, well, here comes the answer. It's not e takes d5, which is the, the typical move in these knight to d5 sack uh, variations in, in the Nidwerf, but the brilliant knight to c6. And this was played by women's world champion, well, then women's world champion, Maya Chabertinidze against Siemens Voiris in Tallinn in 1980. And uh, Chabertinidze was, um, th this was a line that she had gotten from some, um, some other Georgian grandmasters who were her trainers. Maybe uh, Gufeld was one of them. And uh, she won a beautiful game. The idea is to play e takes d5, and black can no longer play king to d8 to get out because the knight's covering the square. Also, of course, if queen takes c6, e takes d5 is check and, and wins the queen. So Dvoris played bishop takes c6, uh, but e takes d5, bishop b7, dc. And he basically got got blasted to bits, and uh, Chabertinidze went on to win a, uh, a fantastic game in another 12 moves. So e takes d5 is a mistake. The right move here is queen takes d4. And um, Gelfand has had this a couple of times, once against once against Alexander Shabalov and uh, once against Takaro Nakamura. So those games um, continue bishop takes f6, g takes f6, bishop takes b5, queen c5, and now, at one time, b4 was considered the, the important move here, 
But it turns out that Black just takes, and this is what happened in Shabalov against Gelfand, and it was no big deal. Knight c7, king e7, knight b5, a b5, queen h5, rook a2, queen b5, bishop h6, which was a, a brilliant idea, with the point that if queen takes b7, then bishop takes f4, rook h to a8, and um, with, with a very dangerous attack. Now, the position is still roughly equal here. Um, unclear if you prefer, but um, Gelfand went on to win. So that put b4 pretty much out of business. Instead, knight takes f6 check, took over. Now here, king to e7 is bad, so king to d8 was Gelfand's move. Knight takes... Oh, and this, this was almost a novelty. I mean, there were a couple of low-rated games before this where it was played, but Gelfand was the first professional player to use it. And, but, but since then, there have been another 50 games, or 49 or 50 games, um, in this variation. So it's become really hot the last several years. So I'll just get you to the, uh, the place where the theory goes. Takes, takes, knight f8, rook f8, queen a3. And now here, Gelfand played rook to c8, which is okay. Uh, more common seems to be king to e8 nowadays. And for further details, you're going to have to watch the chess base show. But... This is certainly enough to, to give you a, a, a broad sense of what goes on. Okay, I'll, I'll give one more move. So, of course, queen takes d6. And now here, okay, rook to c8 would transpose into the immediate rook c8, queen d6, king e8, which was the Gelfand game, Nakamura Gelfand, won by Gelfand. Um, but also after king e8, queen d6, instead of rook to c8, black can also play queen to c6. All right, and again, there's lots of theory, and I think the variation, it's, it's still developing and still still ongoing in both the queen to c6 and rook to c8 variations. All right, so for more details, consult your database or watch my, my chess base show. Um, okay, enough advertising for that, but, you know, it's, count, it's, it's advertising both ways, so I use that to encourage people to come over and, and join in the chess video crowd as well. All right, well... One last ad, and this time it's from my blog, which is at chessmind.powerblogs.com, chessmind.powerblogs.com. So take a look at that, too. I, I update it every day, and, um, well, have a look, and I think you'll, you'll enjoy it. Anyway, no more ads, so I, I usually don't give, give ads during the show, but um, here I threw in a few. So apologies to those who were offended, but uh, I think those of you who check it out will, will, will be glad you did. Anyway... That covers everything in the Nidorf, at least to some extent. Obviously, it's not really covering everything, but covers all the main variations to some degree, except for bishop to e7. And just to uh, move that along a little bit, we'll, the, the, what we'll consider continues queen f3, queen c7, castles, knight b to d7, and then here there are various alternatives um, that, are, that are possible. Also, um, yeah, there's the h6 variation too. And, and this is quite, quite um, fascinating, and there's an interesting story behind it. So we'll look at this as well. All right, so all of this is for next time. Uh, enjoy, and I will see you, see you then. Bye-bye.